three speakers for those wonderful presentations. Um, before we move to the question and answer session, I just want to um, make one note, which is that if you were paying attention to that timeline, what you'll see is, is that the final bill may be coming up for the vote before the end of the semester. So our hope is, is that if that does come about, that we'll have one more event um, in our series here on healthcare reform to talk about the, what actually has gotten into the final bill. So keep your eyes open for that towards the end of the semester. If, if, things, if that timeline doesn't, goes later than that, then we would have it early next semester. So, um, so what we'll do now is have questions from the audience. Um, and uh, I'll repeat questions back to you so that everybody can hear them before turning it over to the panelists. So, um, that's it? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I know that employers get huge tax credits for the health insurance that they provide, and we're talking about maybe subsidies being given to people or people being taxed for their health insurance. Is there any discussion about people getting tax credits for the price of the health insurance that they're being paid for? I mean, being paid, and I don't know why you're talking about it. Well, you can, you can the question. All right. So, all right. So, uh, to start with the easy part, which is repeating the question, uh, <laughs> as as some of you are aware, uh, with the employer finance side of health insurance, not only is is that treated as a tax free benefit to the employee, but employers actually can write it off as a cost of business, and so there is an implicit tax subsidy that goes to both employers and employees on this front. And so the question is, under what circumstances would it make sense to kind of have a matching set of subsidies, I think, to, to go to individuals as opposed to just employers? Well, for the people who have to then, if they can't get it from their employer, if they have to right. go out and buy it in the marketplace, right. why wouldn't they get, get a tax credit if the government is going to force them right. and that, and that the in, public market? Right, exactly. And that, in principle, are what the subsidies are supposed to do as part of the insurance exchange. But this is where, uh, this is to, to, to play on Laura's uh, title for the session, this is where they, the, the devil really is in the details. Of the two Senate bills, the one that came out of Health and Education and the one that came out of Senate Finance, and only, only people who understand the arcane ways of Congress can understand why every committee writes their own bill. But there were two bills that the Senate leadership has been consolidating together. The generosity of the subsidies varied about threefold. That is, for the Health Education Committee's bill, uh, the so-called HELP bill, uh, basically expenditures were capped at roughly around 5% of income. It varied a little bit by income, but about 5% of income. Uh, the Senate Finance Committee had expenditures that could go as high as 15, 16, or 17% of income. So there was big differences. Now, I haven't seen the Reed consolidation to know which of those subsidies. We read a couple of blocks before yeah. the left. Yeah, so we don't really know which, and, and probably there was some effort to split the difference. But you know, let's say you split the difference exactly and you wind up with subsidies that still leave you with seven, eight, nine, ten percent of income at risk with, the, with these plans. You gotta understand, guys, that for a lot of people with income above Medicaid eligibility, even if it's 150% of poverty, people do not have five to 10% of income to spend in a discretionary way. And so the consequence will be either they'll have to go uninsured and just try to plead an exemption, which won't be great in terms of getting people coverage, or even worse, people will purchase policies but then be so worried about the cost sharing implications, it will be as if they're uninsured. Right, because even if you have insurance, but you can't afford the cost sharing, you're not going to use the services. And so the big catch on this, and this has been the big challenge with the Massachusetts implementation, which is in many ways the model for the federal legislation, has been trying to keep the policies affordable to people even when they have mandated coverage. And the truth is, it's been working all okay in the initial years in Massachusetts, but as costs go up, it's getting less and less affordable. It's not clear, given the current provisions, that there won't be a big swath of 20, 30 percent of the public for whom insurance simply stays unaffordable. And they'll just have to plead an exemption. Thank you. Um, yeah. And 
the, the thing to I think also is that, that you refer back to middle class, but what I've been hearing a lot over the past couple of years is that the separation between the upper class and the middle class is growing to the point that it's very much becoming just upper class and middle class, and there's not much in between. I was wondering how much that was impacting this whole debate of health insurance. So the, the question is, how much is the growing um, income gap between the upper class and what we euphemistically refer to as the middle class, but which is really, you know, probably more a working class cohort, how much is that growing divide uh, coming into the debate? You know, the, the problem is that Americans, um, don't like to be called anything but middle class. So it's almost impossible for the reality of people's income levels to come into any debate in any organizing effort in this country. So, and that has been the case since, you know, the, the McCarthy era trials when a active organizing based on class was driven pretty much underground. So, um, I think I, I live in Massachusetts, and um, I would say that folks who would consider themselves in every other way middle class are getting free health care through what we call the, the Commonwealth Care Plan. They're paying nothing or very little because, you know, you can have a policy, for example, that costs 400 a month, but you have $2,500 copay uh, deductible before you can use a service for someone like my age, you know, a colonoscopy, for example. So it really isn't a very affordable arrangement. We have coverage, but it is kind of scary to figure out like how one would pay for um, a hospital stay or even just necessary preventive testing at this point. And you know, the I think the subsidy rates for people in Massachusetts. Um, for an individual is about twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars. You still get subsidized, so that's that's a pretty uh, su substantial uh, move into a group that considers itself middle class. Uh, in terms of the abortion issue that was raised by uh, Mr. Hannick. Uh, I think, uh, admittedly, the coverage seems to be fuzzy. You talked about 1920, they don't uh, not allow uh, subsidizing government money for abortion. But there were two bills that I remember reading about that they attempted to clarify that abortion would not be covered by this re reform health plan. And they were both defeated. So there was, for people of my ilk who believe in right to life, mm -hmm. we're against it in the present way. I agree there should be reform, there should be reform. But there's so many other things that have to be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. One thing that's important, in my age, I'm 83. I go to the doctor and go, I have to have this test and that, mm -hmm. they practice defensive medicine because of the need for tort reform, mm -hmm. where they would put some kind of limits on the uh, tremendous uh, uh, claims that people make, and they have to, the doctors have to pay high insurance for their malpractice. They have to practice defensive medicine, and, uh, and that's why it's such an expensive proposition. The idea of having you know, what you mentioned in, in your paper here about some kind of uh, uh, savings, I think that's all conjecture. 980 billion, whatever the figure was, that's all conjecture. I think if they don't pass tort reform, if they don't eliminate uh, the uh, abortion, make it clear, I think uh, this bill in its present form is totally inadequate. Um, well, what I can say about uh, the amendments that were offered during the committee process around uh, access to abortion-related services is 
um, by supposedly trying to clarify it, they're trying to straddle both camps within the Democratic Conference and Congress, both the abortion rights supporters and the pro-life supporters in Congress. So I don't actually know how much they clarified it, quite frankly. Have you been following this? Have you either of you been following it at all? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, with regard to the question of tort reform, this is an idea that comes up which um, many people believe one of the cost drivers for that Mark talked about for healthcare cost growth is so-called defensive medicine, where physicians uh, prescribe unnecessarily duplicative or over-prescribed services a way to avoid uh, malpractice lawsuits and claims. Um, and that this drives up um, mal malpractice insurance rates for providers and um, that therefore what we need to do is cap the amount of uh, pain and suffering uh, awards as part of uh, medical malpractice law. Um, I'm not an expert in this stuff, so let me just say that at the outset. I think that, and Mark, you can maybe chime in here more if you know more. Um, my sense is that that is probably somewhat of a factor, but my sense from people who've done the research is that it's overstated as in its importance. Um, that's not to discount it. It's just to say that um, it's not a biggest factor as some people would like to claim. Do you want to? Anymore. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief on this, but you know the evidence is that yes, malpractice claims and costs are higher in the U.S. than say the other Anglo-American countries like Canada, New Zealand, or the U.K. But they're only about thirty to forty percent higher. So it's it's a little bit of a driver of increased costs, but again, as Mark H. suggested, probably not as dramatic as you'd expect. Now, equally important, there are lots of good reasons to have tort reform. Right. The problem is not simply that people who win awards get too big awards, but a lot of other people who are injured in the healthcare system don't get compensation. Right. So going to a, a no-fault system that doesn't require suing in order to give people compensation and having smaller average awards for everyone would serve everyone well. And a lot of other countries have no-fault compensation systems, and inarguably, that's one thing you probably get bipartisan consensus on, that that would be a much better system than what we have currently. But they're not talking about that at all. <laughs> That's help my point. That's my point. Um, I was just wondering if any of you could speak a little bit more about the um, consequences of not providing care for undocumented immigrants, which you know, several like I think it's like 14 billion in the U.S. right now, and just the financial consequences. Um, to taxpayers and to undocumented immigrants, and also public health consequences. So I don't know if any of you can address that at all. Well, let me just, uh, the question is asking about uh, both the, I guess, uh, uh, the consequences of not providing coverage to undocumented immigrants, both public health consequences and what was the and other? And financial. And financial consequences. Uh, I'll let the others comment maybe on some of those, but let me just say the, this issue of immigrant coverage in the debate in Congress is not based on rationality at all, okay? It's based on political posturing and fear-mongering and xenophobia. Um, that's what's going on here, and it's gotten to the point where it is such a political hot potato that nobody wants to go near it with uh, 10 10 foot poles. Um, and so they're just avoiding it altogether. That's sort of what's going on politically. My, la my work in the last 15 years has been with immigrant and refugee women, and we have a kind of don't ask, don't tell policy about status, um, at least in the beginning. But it's become, it, we can always tell when. Um, women are not documented because their relationship, they will not establish a relationship to a health clinic, say, that has translators in 10 different languages. So, you know, the barriers to care, one of the big ones is that you, 
you're not understood when you go in, and that's not the case where we operate in Revere, Massachusetts. Um, but I, I have to say the the other um, the other issue that's going along with this um, right now, which is as frightening, is um, that in many states, including a progressive one like Massachusetts, they're doing house raids on, on immigrants. So it's, it's part of the fear is if I go to the clinic, they'll turn my name in. So even if I go to pay out of pocket. So it's all sort of becoming one big um, kind of snowballing avalanche of um, health problems, stress-related problems, income problems for for the uh, immigrant populations. And I have to say, Massachusetts, one of the ways that the state balanced its budget was to drop legal immigrants from, from the uh, state comprehensive plan. So uh, if you're not a citizen, you're just at risk of, of being left out because you really have no rights beyond a few basic ones like you know, illegal search and seizure. Let me just add that here in New York, we do cover legal immigrants through our public insurance program based on a court case from earlier this decade where the New York State Court of Appeals held that the state constitution required the state to do this under its general health and welfare clause. Um, and in our state child health insurance program, we don't ask about the status of children. So um, any and all children can theoretically have access to coverage through that program. Um, you talked about regulation of the insurance industry. Is there any talk about regulation of big pharma? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, I spoke a bit about regula regulation of insurance. What about the pharmaceutical industry? Um, no, is the answer. Um, they did cut a minor deal. One of the president's political strategies to get health care reform moved through Congress is to neutralize the special interests that have time and time again sort of stopped the process. And um, at the very least, if they didn't necessarily get on board the bandwagon, they didn't try to stop the bandwagon. So they've been cutting deals with various the special interests. One of the deals that they cut back in the, I think it was the summer or late spring, um, was with the pharmaceutical industry that they would, the pharmaceutical industry would be willing to forego $80 billion in their profits over this 10 year period. Um, if they, that they would, be able, they would be willing to put that on the table, and that's all they would be asked to do, and then the federal government wouldn't try to do anything else. Now that's $8 billion a year, which is chump change in the pharmaceutical industry. So the House is now trying to double that amount to around $160 billion, which still wouldn't be a lot of sweat off their back, but they're pushing back saying, no, we cut a deal, and this is the deal. Um, the pharmaceutical industry is a very powerful influence in Washington, and um, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I have one more follow-up on the, the immigrant uh, issue, the illegal immigrant issue, and that is um, there basically would be no change with the emergency um, It turns out it, it is in a few states. California and Texas, it proves to be fairly substantial. But one of the things that, <laughs> there's a great irony about all this, is that in a lot of cases, illegal immigrants return to their home countries for their medical care. Because A, it's cheaper, and B, it's probably better in many cases than the care they would otherwise get in this country. So, uh, so there is a weird way in which we're actually just exporting those costs back to those countries. And some people would think that's fair, some people would think that's unfair, but, but what happens is that uh, those costs are very unevenly distributed. They're, they're felt particularly in a couple of different states, and they're felt in particular communities within different states. And so I'm, I'm kind of proud to say that New Haven is one of those communities that 
uh, has set up essentially a mandatory free access to everyone, whatever your, your immigrant status is, and it just pays for everything off, off the top. And that means that we carry quite substantial cost. We've had like Ecuador opened an embassy in New Haven just because of what we were doing as a city. So, so it's a strange kind of politics, but what it means is you get huge asymmetries in who's actually paying the bill under those circumstances. Do you want to say anything? I would just say overall, I don't think it's probably that much money because most undocumented immigrants are only going to seek that emergency care when it really gets to the point where they have no other choice but to do otherwise. Otherwise, they don't go, as Rebecca said. Um, no, I, so I don't major think major it's that much money. Major, major yeah. Um, I was wondering, Massachusetts is brought up often as a model. It's interesting that New York, which has guaranteed issue insurance, which has groups already available, for example, for self-employed people, um, which has Healthy New York, which I think is a brilliant system. I mean, basically, the government as reinsurer, to a point, um, is, never, is never brought up in the discussion. I understand why Massachusetts is discussed so frequently. And I know everyone's waiting to see what the ultimate outcome of Massachusetts experiment is. But I'm wondering why the Healthy New York um, model was never or is never discussed. Any particular reason? <laughs> I really like this presentation. Yeah. Um, for those of you not familiar, she's asking a question about, we have a special program here in New York for some uninsured individuals and small businesses that the state operates called Healthy New York. And it provides semi-comprehensive coverage. It's not fully comprehensive as if you went into the individual market and bought it by yourself, but it offers okay benefits if you don't particularly need a lot of health care or rehab or stuff like or mental health. I'm sorry, I misspoke. You need a lot of mental health services or prescription drugs. No, no uh, it's, uh, yeah, I don't think there are any, yeah. There's limited prescription drug services. I know there's no rehab. And so it's a somewhat of a limited comprehensive benefit, if I can use that terminology. <laughs> um, so, and part of the reason it's able to do this and offer somewhat cheaper rates than the purely private market, it's run through private insurers, um, to people who are eligible for that program. And you have to be up only up to 250% of the poverty level to get into it. Um, is that they, the state acts as a quote-unquote reinsurer, which is a technical term, which means it insures a certain segment of high-cost claims for those insurance plans, so they don't have to carry them themselves, and then the rates are lower for everybody, is sort of how it works. And so the question that you're asking is, why hasn't the federal government looked at that as a possible model, as a way to go, particularly for plans for uninsured people or small business, so forth? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. What I do know is that one of the Senate bills contemplates setting up a temporary high-risk pool that would be in effect fairly immediately after passage of legislation until various comp other components of this legislation roll out. It's one thing I didn't say in my remarks, but this legislation has different components and they're expected to roll out over roughly a 10-year period. And most of the major stuff, like the exchange and so forth, you're not, we're not going to see for three or four years because they've got to sort of get a whole lot of stuff up and running and ready to debut all at once because they all kind of work together. And so that's going to take them a little bit of time. The second thing is, back to this budget figure that I talked about, they're trying to project this budget figure over a 10-year period when they passed the bill in 2009, but if they don't start implementing it until 2013, they're actually only paying for six years of change rather than 10 years of change. And it allows them to bring the number down to under a trillion dollars. So this is a budget gimmick that they're doing. So there, <laughs> there is some talk now in the Senate where some of the Democratic senators are saying to the administration, Whoa, you want us to go through two election cycles, 2010 and 2012, without voters seeing they're getting anything out of this bill? That is not a good idea politically. 
And so they're now starting to think about accelerating some of that stuff a little bit. Yeah, let me, let me build on this. Some of you, if you're old enough, will remember in 1988, uh, Congress enacted something called the Medicare Catastrophic Amendments. And this was an effort to expand Medicare coverage. It was an early version of prescription drug coverage, and it was a way of trying to provide better protection for low-income Medicare beneficiaries. It had the same kind of staged implementation that is currently incorporated into the, uh, the existing health reform. And what happened was the opponents, even after it had been enacted, it was enacted virtually unanimously by both houses of Congress in 1988. But because it had delayed implementation, the opponents waged a major campaign to turn Medicare beneficiaries against the act. No one was seeing any benefits yet, but they were already starting to pay the taxes to support it. So everyone thought, I'm getting nothing out of this. I'm paying all these taxes. What a crock, right? What, what have they pulled over on me? And what happened was they were able to get about a million elders to write to Congress. And in 1989, literally a year after the bill was initially enacted, it was repealed in most of its parts by the exact same Congress uh, for, with exactly the opposite vote, so almost unanimous repeal. And so it, the bill is extremely vulnerable if it tries to implement costs before it implements benefits. And you can enact something and it could all fall apart. And so this is not an idle threat or idle concern. Uh, and I just realized I didn't actually finish my answer to your question. So this temporary high risk pool, they're looking for a reinsurance mechanism like Healthy New York to fund that. But it would only exist until these other big chunks come into play and then that, that temporary thing goes away. So this last, I guess in this last year, with the, through the sponsorship of uh, both, oh, I'm sorry. So where does mental health care fit in to this whole picture? Sorry about that. Um, there, so both Edward and his son Patrick co-sponsored bills to make coverage of mental health and autism um, a requirement of any health plan to increase coverage to take away some of the, um, the penalties and, and uh, lack of access that uh, folks needing both mental health coverage and treatment for their autistic children and adults um, had been experiencing. So that should get rolled into, that should carry through all the insurance plans. Um, it's better, I, I'm not sure, um, I mean, it'd be interesting to hear, if this is probably not the forum, how that's working. Because, you know, most aut autistic services, services for, and treatment of autism happens through the education system. So it's a, very, it's a very strange setup, and I'm not sure how it's working, but that's how it should roll out, is through that bill. I would like to clarify, um, my under I would like clarification from the panel. My understanding of mental health parity laws right now, the coverage is only if the company already has mental health coverage. If they don't have mental health coverage, I don't think they have to give the parity. So is, are the health care reform bills in the Senate and in the House right now addressing the fact that mental health coverage needs to be addressed? If, if the, <laughs> sorry, the question is, even though parity legislation has been enacted at various levels at both state and federal level, there are often loopholes in terms of what companies do and under what circumstances. So if they don't offer any mental health care benefits, do they have to offer parity? Or if they offer some, does it have to be parity with physical health coverage? If the Blue Cross Federal Employees Health Benefits Plan is in fact the model for the exchange, then in fact parity will be put into place because this goes back to the Clinton administration where they administratively required that parity be part of the federal employee health benefit program. So the answer is yes, that would be overridden by the, the new provisions. And then can you also comment on how this is all, the health reform proposals will affect self-insured plans? Because right now self-insured plans are able to get around a lot of mandates. Mm -hmm. So what is the provision that's being introduced with all of the bills? 
Well, all this insurance regulation stuff would, first of all, uh, the question is uh, for so-called self-insured plans, I'll explain what they are in a minute for people who may not know. Will they have to follow all these new rules that are coming up? Because right now, up until now, regulation of insurance has primarily, if not exclusively, happened at state levels, which is why states vary widely. Self-insured plans are where the employer or the group decides to insure itself rather than going to an insurance company and buying a policy from them. They, just, they take some money of their own, set it aside in their own insurance pool and pay their claims out of it. Now oftentimes employers will contract with insurance companies to administer those pools. So. The claim forms you fill out and get will look almost exactly as if you have regular insurance and if you're an employee, you won't know necessarily if you're in what's called a fully insured plan or a self-insured plan. Where the difference being in a self-insured plan, the company carries the risk. In a fully insured plan, the insurer carries the risk. That's kind of the philosophical difference between the two. And the reason that it exists in the employer marketplace is it's actually cheaper for large companies to provide coverage this way than going through an insurance company. And they've kind of figured this out and there's been a couple of decades of experience of it right now. But because those plans are allowed under federal law, under a law called the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, which was primarily a law around pension reform, but it had some other small provisions around other benefits that has grown to become this enormous elephant in the health insurance system nationwide and has pretty much precluded a lot of states from moving forward where they'd want to go otherwise. That's another lecture for another day. But at any rate, so your question of um, uh, self-insured plans as a consequence have little or no regulation. The federal government provides a little bit now. So the question is, what happens to them under this new system? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Initially, the plans in the exchange will have to meet all these new insurance regulations. And then um, those regulations, again, over this 10-year period, will step out beyond the exchange into the larger private market, including the self-insured market. So I don't have the exact specifics for you. Um, also, as they open up the exchange to allow larger and larger employers to go into it to purchase coverage if they want to do so rather than the open market, um, there will be some implications there for self-insured plans too. So. Under ERISA um, is where they get around all the loopholes, I right. think, or um, they take advantage of the loopholes, and they're not considered insurance. It's technically, self-insured plans are technically not insurance. They're right. considered a benefit. It's a different animal, legally. Right, so, I'm, so they're really, just, they're not addressing it yet, whether that will be considered insurance or not considered insurance. Those plans will have to meet these new standards for insurance companies, again, over time. So the question is, uh, so the comment was that when costs go up, when costs go up, yeah, let me let me just is that, that's the question. Yeah. So 
we, we have someone using a device to hear this, so I want to repeat what you said, okay? Um, when, what happens when, say, you become unemployed and you end up in a system that allows you to keep your insurance, but the costs go up drastically? Um, and that will be, if it was the New York system, that would be part of this system that is being put in place uh, through our current national legislation. And my, my answer to that is that's why this, the Massachusetts plan is being held up as an example, because that can't happen. If you become unemployed and you have to go and get a policy, instead of it going up to $1,900, it'll go up to $800. Because it's just like a normal plan at the kind of high end of employee contribution plans is what ends up happening. But that's not the high end in New York State. I'm telling you, that that's why they're looking at Massachusetts as the example and not New York. Because the Massachusetts plan provides for that cost control already on that kind of event. And hopefully the national plan will as well. I just want to follow up on the, on the question, on the discussion, which is, and to ask another question, which is, is, is part of the difference the exchange that as an individual who's unemployed, not through an employer, you'd be able to get insurance through an exchange, which means that just as, as Mark was talking about pooling of risks, if you're joining the exchange, you're pooling your risk with everyone else in the exchange. Whereas if you're just a single unemployed person, the insurance company is sort of taking on your risk by yourself, which means you end up paying more. Is that essentially the answer? And then my it's other- part of, It's yeah, part of the answer. Okay, yeah, so, so let's lead further into the answer that I've gotten us. And then my other question, which I've been sort of wanting to ask, is that I've read about exchanges in states that have, exchanges that are similar to what's being proposed that have been started in states like California and Texas that failed, that weren't successful. And so how can we, if the exchange is passed at the federal level, how can we make it something that's a success? Let's make two questions. Let me get back to her question and then we'll go to your question. Um, the main reason why policies are ex expensive in the individual market in New York is that we require insurers to cover everybody regardless of their health history, gender, occupation, or age. Um, we require them to not differentiate the premium based on any of those four factors. And we have comprehensive benefit mandates so that when you buy insurance, it's really going to be there for you and not what we call a Swiss cheese policy that's full of holes. So that's why policies in New York are good. So we have good consumer protections in that regard, but, and this is the big but, it's not cheap. Um, now part of this idea of the individual mandate making people buy and carry coverage if they don't have it some other way is in particular to bring a lot of people into the health insurance pool that aren't there right now, particularly healthier or, and or younger people relative to everybody else who's in the pool. Um, and so the idea that in and of itself along with the exchange will bring rates down, but you're absolutely right, in those states where they don't have those laws in place, some people are going to see their rates dramatically increase. But what's also going to happen in those states is that people with poorer health profiles are going to see their rates drop, and people who heretofore wouldn't have access to the insurance market at all are going to have options available to them which will be, quote unquote, affordable. So there are trade-offs that are going to happen here, and I think this gets back to, I can't remember which one of you two said it, this whole concept of social solidarity, we're all in this together, which is a foreign concept in American political culture by and large, um, but is not a foreign concept at all in European cultures, which is why they look at us in our healthcare system in our crisis and they look at us like we're from Mars. They're like, what do you mean you don't provide healthcare? What do you, why are you even having this political debate? It's a given, just as somebody, Mark was describing in this poem. We provide police and fire services. We provide potable water. We provide public education. We provide transportation systems. We provide all these things for people. And in those other societies, healthcare is considered one of those public social goods that everybody gets. It's a given. The only question is, how are you going to do it and how do you figure it out? We haven't yet made that commitment. So 
Mark is absolutely right. The first thing, and what I'm really hopeful about with this debate is, as woefully inadequate as this legislation will be at the end, from those of us from the advocacy side of things, you know, we'd like to see a lot better bill. This is going to be the first time where we as a society are going to make a statement that we are going to attempt to provide everybody with affordable health insurance coverage. Now, that will get you so far. And the other question is, what about the delivery system? You know, how do we make sure that you have you get an insurance card, but you have some place to go, and that you know how to navigate all that, and that your out-of-pocket costs are such that you can afford to use the coverage. It's not, so those are all the questions um, that are part of the debate, too. Way in the back. Uh, I actually have a follow-up to that question. Uh, you spoke about the very highly politicized nature of this entire debate, and Mark Schlesinger, you talked about the relative poor condition and quality of our healthcare system. So considering the rather uh, surfacy fear of socialism in this country, I was wondering whether any of you was interested in talking about countries specifically that you thought had a good healthcare model and in the way that that related to their economic system and political structure. <laughs> All right, so let me start. Uh, the, yes, so let me start by repeating the question. Uh, so the question is, how, it's really, I think, a twofold question. One is, are there models from other countries that would look attractive and could help us actually think sensibly about reform in this country? But second, given the uh, somewhat veiled xenophobia that's always associated with healthcare reform that Rebecca described as being associated with healthcare reform for the last century, and, and she's very right, can we actually use any of those comparative models as a way of making for a more compelling case that, yes, we can learn something useful from this. Now, here's the tricky part. In order to answer the second question, that is to have a country look enough like the US that people will say, oh, they're kind of like us, maybe we can emulate them a little. Uh, many people would argue that what you want to have is a culture that looks somewhat similar, so often a kind of uh, Commonwealth country, Anglo-American model, which has a similar judicial system, yada, 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 all the things that looks kind of similar. On the other hand, one of the things that we've seen as a primary uh, building block of healthcare reform in this country and of the healthcare financing system in this country is the idea that people want to have choice and want to have multiple insurers. And those two categories of comparison are basically mutually exclusive. There are a number of other countries out there, Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands, that have multiple insurer models that the US could really learn from a lot to how to make a multiple insurer model work in a more equitable and effective way. There are other countries out there, the Commonwealth countries, where we have a common cultural tradition, but they don't have a multiple insurance model. And so what we're missing is the country that looks similar enough to us, like they speak a common language with us, well, kind of, uh, or, and a country that has a healthcare financing system that looks enough like ours that we could say, oh, that looks kind of familiar. And in the absence of those two things, it's actually pretty hard to make a case to policymakers that these other models are transportable back to the US. Now, that being said, I would argue that Germany, Netherlands, and Switzerland can teach us a lot, but whether we can convince policymakers those are lessons that we can learn, I honestly am not sure. German Socialist Medicine. German Socialist Medicine. Uh, I have another, a follow-up question. I have another question. It might be related, I'm not sure. First of all, um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about the U.S. is that they we seem to simultaneously take pride in a sort of multicultural, some people call it theme park, other people call it mosaic, and, sort of, and at the same time, there's a constant xenophobic trend. And the, the, the group that that aim towards changes every decade or two, but it's always there. And and from my understanding, in countries such as Switzerland, Germany, and Netherlands, right now there's kind of a similar dynamic because they're getting a lot of immigrants, but 
they're not accustomed, they haven't lived with that, and it, 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 I'm not sure how much it's affecting the government system, but there's that concern that, that their whole perception of the changing of dynamic will change, and I'm not sure how. I, I, I think it's really, but I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. Just historically, the xenophobic backlash is about every 30 years. And it follows, generally speaking, kind of boom and bust cycles. So whenever there's a recession or a depression, um, then the, the backlash against immigrants um, gets to be really strong. Similarly, there's a change in immigration policy about what groups can come in about every 30 years. So you end up with a new group feeling like they're Americans about 20 years in. So they start out being Chinese or Gambian or uh, some other place, and then they're Asian American or they're African American 20 years later. And, and that's where the illusion of multiculturalism <laughs> comes from, is that constant assimilation, the constant newness of groups and the constant assimilation of groups. Um, but there's always under that a, a xenophobia generally born of economic fear. So, and that's, that's where we are right now. And healthcare reform isn't going to make that go away. Even, you know, jobs coming back at some astounding rate over the next two years is probably not going to make that go away because this period is different from other periods and just the market saturation of immigrant hatred, um, I think. Um, you know, if somebody can market an illegal alien Halloween costume, then you know your country has gone over, it has a little fake green card that the kid can hold up, has gone over the edge. So. In that section of the bill, that I'm sorry, the question was um, about the healthcare workforce in particular and jobs being available and what kind of jobs and so forth. In that emphasis that I talked about that the bill is going to try to do around system reform, there's a whole new thrust on uh, primary and preventive care that I talked about. Right now, compared to other nations, we have something like one third <coughs> primary care providers to 20% is it? Okay. I don't know what the latest statistics are. And everybody else are specialists of one sort. When you look at other nations' health systems, it's almost completely flipped the opposite. And that's part of the reason why their health care costs are so much lower, because they're preventing disease and they're stopping it when it get, illness when it gets started. They're treating it at a much lower level of intensity uh, and so forth. So there's stuff in there. There's stuff in there around... Um, improving the cultural competence and diversity of the healthcare workforce. There's stuff in there about so-called physician extenders, which would be uh, anyone from nurse practitioners to midwives to physician's assistants, kinds of folks as we move toward this whole system of primary and community-based preventive care, much more than we have now. The American system is basically an acute tertiary care sickness-oriented system. That's when you enter the health system at most points, otherwise you don't have a lot of contact with it particularly. So there's a whole lot of stuff in there around the healthcare workforce and, and incentives and loan forgiveness for students that go through certain programs to practice in medically underserved areas and things like that. So, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Yeah. On that point, uh, uh, is there anything about, um, you know, expanding the network of federally qualified health centers and community health centers for you know, for people to actually have access to a medical home? 
Uh, yes, and in fact, um, this will continue. The one, uh, the question is, what about federally qualified health centers, community health centers? Are they going to be expanded? Yes, there will be some funds in there to do that. That's where they envision a lot of this primary and preventive care happening, uh, particularly in communities that are heretofore have had access to no services. And that was one of the challenges when the Massachusetts law went into effect is they all of a sudden realized they didn't not only have the capacity, but in particular, they didn't have the primary care capacity. <laughs> Um, and so there's stuff in there about that. The one interesting thing that did happen over the eight years of the Bush administration was, the one good thing they did do was dramatically expand the number of community health centers, which is a good thing. I think they did it somewhat of the elitist model of a two-tiered healthcare system. The hoi polloi can go here, but we have our own boutique plans and providers up here. But nonetheless, they did expand those settings. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we might take our last question from Laura Wheel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if the success of health reform is based, is really predicated on cost savings, um, how does one reconcile the fact that we're not changing the fundamental payer system in this country, so it stays as a profit-making system and the complexity of it remains hopeless, such that hospitals spend 25% of their budget simply on collecting payments. I mean, how, 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 give us some hope here. <laughs> <laughs> give this to you. <laughs> uh, all right, so to repeat the question, uh, given the fact that most of the emphasis is in the reform proposals has gone to affordability and financing of access without a fundamental change in how providers are reimbursed and therefore the incentives to overspend and to have really high administrative costs with a fragmented financing and delivery system. How, how in fact can we keep the healthcare system quasi affordable at least even within the, the strange bounds of affordability that we have in this country? Uh, and I think the answer is, Laura, you can't. And that's why I've predicated my remarks on this notion that this is going to be the first step of a series of reforms. And I think Mark H. is right. If we can establish, and I think everyone, including the Obama administration, and I have lots of friends in the Obama administration, everyone thinks that if you can establish this beachhead of collective responsibility, then you can get leverage on the cost containment issue as a next round in. But for a variety of reasons, the cost containment aspects of the current reform legislation are largely smoke and mirrors. I don't think anyone really believes them, and anyone really believes the CBO estimates around which they're based. And everyone's kind of in a don't ask, don't tell mode that basically says, look, let's get this in place, let's get this up and running, and then we'll come back and tackle cost containment in a more robust way. And I think that's the secret political compromise that no one wants to talk about. Um, yeah, and I guess this is often what's happened when other countries' systems have come into being, and they have also stepped out over time. Um, there's the famous phrase when the British NHS came in, the guy who created that system whose name escapes me at the moment, his famous phrase was they were worried about uh, resistance, if not outright opposition from physicians in particular. And the phrase was, fill their mouths with gold. Bevins. Evans, but yeah, Bevins, that's right, is the guy's name. Um, and so the idea is, get the new architecture and system up and running, whatever it takes, and then once you have that in place, you can begin to rationalize within it. But until then, you can't rationalize it. And that's part of the problem here in this country right now. We don't have a real system, per se, we have all these systems which are bumping up against each other and they're not designed in any ra rational way to fit together as a puzzle necessarily. So that's kind of what they're trying to do here. Um, and so that's kind of what, yeah, Mark is absolutely right. Everybody's kind of winking and nodding. Okay, the CBO gives us this. Is Okay, that gives us the political cover. Let's go and do it. 
Um, it may be smoke and mirrors. There's also a lot of stuff in here that's going to be new. They don't know how to crunch the numbers for it. Um, and to some extent, they've left some things out of the number crunching altogether, which is what the CBO has been criticized for to some degree. So it may end up, it could be that this actually does save money. Um, and the, the public plan is very much envisioned as being one big thing to leverage a lot of that cost control, um, which make the difference as to what kind of public plan we get as to whether we can actually do that. I just have, can I just add a quick question? <laughs> well, it looks like we've generated with the public. Hold on one second. Go ahead. Um, oh, sorry. Just, uh, <laughs> let me just check the audience. It's now 8, and so that's the end of our schedule time. Do people want to go? Should we let some people go and other people ask questions? Or our panelists, do you, any of you have trains that you're... Well, let me take these two questions. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's take the last two questions that all is, is one and answer them all as one. Okay, okay so, yeah. So what's your question? Mine was more in terms of cost reduction. And I heard that with the public option, they were not allowing people who already had employee, man, employee benefits to opt into the public option if they wanted. And that, to me, would be the whole, a good start anyway in, in lowering costs, because it seems like we're going to have two separate systems. And then if you can, re and then you really would be able to compare what the government provides, what somebody else would provide, and the cost. It just doesn't, again, they're not integrated systems. So unless people could choose, really choose, from the public option or the private, and I know people find that their private is even expensive right now. So I guess it was more a comment than, <laughs> than a question, but. Yeah. What I was gonna say just in response to what Mark just said is given all the cynicism around all of this health care legislation, what would you think of Obama just stepping up and saying what you just said? I mean the American people are not as stupid as the administration <laughs> and Congress think they are. You in fact you also have a question on Moved out of the table. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to say something about the employer opt out. So the, the question was that what happens, or the comment, what happens when folks want to opt out of their employer sponsored plan for the public option and they're not allowed to because that's what one version of this might be? Historically, the way we got to the health insurance coverage we have was when there was this tacit agreement that employers would cover people. And they don't want to lose that. They don't want employers to decide they're not, they don't have to pay for health insurance. And I don't know how they rationalize that, but that's, that's part of the argument. Um, and just in terms of this other comment, I, I told the class last week, I guess, or two weeks ago, I was in Akron, Ohio doing some leafleting during the big you know, everybody back home, town meeting time. And I had several conversations that were disturbing, but one that was especially with an elderly gentleman who had just started his Medicare coverage who claimed he didn't have government health insurance. And that I could not convince him that he had it. And, and I'm not saying Americans are stupid. I'm saying that the blinders are really hard to remove. And, attachment to views is really strong. <laughs> All right, so, so let me build on what I said earlier about cost containment in, in two different ways. One, you're exactly right that in a more robust system, the public plan would be available to everyone, but this is another example of trying to get the camel's nose under the tent because it's a very, it is a very close and very divided Democratic Party right now that's even allowing a public plan to get into the price. So Reed barely went for a public option. And so the idea is do it in the least obtrusive way possible. Understand that over time it will become more robust. More people will be given options in. That's the plan to let the thing evolve in all the ways that Mark described. Many parts of the plan are going to evolve over time. And you know the the full most attractive versions of the plan are likely to be five, six, seven years off, and it's likely to undergo a series of revisions and amendments in that process. Back to the more, I think, I think the more interesting question 
of how honest politicians can be about the uh, implausibility of the cost estimates. It's a very tricky compromise. The CBO requirements are in place because Congress imposed it on themselves. Basically said, we don't want, we don't want to allow ourselves to pass things where we haven't essentially decided how the bill will be footed somewhere down the road. So no one believes the 10-year estimates, but Congress basically said we have to have 10-year estimates. And so there's no way for Obama to step around that because the law essentially says you have to have it. And so he can't thumb his nose or whatever other part of his anatomy at this too much because that would seem to be an abrogation of what Congress said they want to do to maintain some fiscal solvency uh, over the federal budget. That said, that's essentially what everyone's doing. And, and the public, I think, is aware of that and equally aware of the implausibility or at least the uncertainties, as Mark would put it, of the uh, cost estimates. And those are just the terms of the debate, and there doesn't seem to be any easy way around them. But I don't think that's inherently a compromise of democratic deliberation so much as a recognition that the plausibility of making these estimates with so many untried provisions in the bill really is so uncertain that you need to take them about as seriously as people are taking them. And I'll just say with regard to that, again, I'll go back to the president's comment when he said, the status quo is not sustainable. It is not an option. So we do have to all link arms and jump together, and it is going to be a leap of faith of sorts. Um, and that's just the way it's going to be. So I think that's why we want to get as much of the good architecture in place and put the meat on the bones as we go along. Senator Wyden has an amendment that he's been pushing which would allow people to opt out of their employer plan if they don't like it and go into the exchange and potentially choose the public plan if they wanted to do that. Right now, that's not the way it would be. You go where your employer goes, which is just exactly how it is now for you if you have employer coverage. You take what they give you. Um, but they are envisioning opening up this exchange over time to allow larger and larger employer groups. And maybe at some point, if there's enough public demand, there will be something where you could opt out of your employer plan and get there. But I think they also want to, because this is an experiment, they want to get this thing up and running and make sure it's kind of going OK before they start expanding to, to larger and larger groups. One last point about this overall budget figure number. This trillion dollar figure that they picked is completely arbitrary. It's only a psychological number. They didn't want to go above it, um, which is why it's, it's still a low ball figure. But they're trying to figure out whatever way they can to make it look like they're doing substantial health care reform without having to spend too much. And again, in the context of how much we would spend otherwise without reform over a 10-year period, this trillion dollars is just this side of chump change. It's not that much money. And in the eyes of many of us, it's like, all right, fill their mouths with gold. If it takes a trillion or more,